Hi, and welcome to the second session on stave two of Christmas Carol. Now, bell task just to begin with. Uh, again, we have a six a day frame uh, with boxes for language, Macbeth, Power and Conflict, Christmas Carol, two of those, and Vocabulary Builder as well. Don't forget, if you have done a different text, not a problem, just ignore the box that applies to the different text that you did. Have a go through, see what you can come up with, and we've had a chance to do that. Press play again on this audio, and I'll run through some answers that you may have um, thought of. Right, let's start with the language. Uh, five words that could be part of a semantic field of memory. I would probably go for something along the lines of uh, recollection, reminisce, memorial, um, evocative, maybe um, commemorate, that kind of thing. But Beth, then, a theme question. What's the link between the image of blood and the theme of guilt or responsibility in relation to Lady Macbeth? Well, um, obviously, in uh, Act 2, scene 2, after the murder of Duncan, there is the idea of blood being on uh, on their hands. Macbeth has blood in his hands, is troubled by it. Lady Macbeth uses his line, you know, my hands are of your colour, but I shame to wear a heart so white, and uh, ridicules him for it. At the same time, that becomes um, the eventual symbol of her guilt in Act 5 when we see her um, sleepwalking and troubled by it mentally. That she feels like she cannot get the blood off her hands because it's become a symbol or a metaphor rather than literal blood, which it was in Act 2. Blood, don't forget, is also particularly troubling because blood is both about the, the violence and the life, but it's also the link also to the idea of, um, of family and shedding of the family blood as well for Catherine Macbeth, maybe less so for, uh, for Lady Macbeth. Imagery in the poetry. How are the images of light and dark used in the emigre? Well, light associated with the past in a positive way in the emigre. Um, the city is, you know, on its own white plain, for example. Um, it's sunlight clear, the memory. And sunlight clear reference refers to both the idea that it's, uh, it's positive and also it's, it's a clear memory as well. And it's, it's quite nice of a play with both of those kind of ideas. Whereas darkness is the idea of negativity and fear and so on. Um, and the idea in the, of the narrator being accused of darkness by people in the city um, and, 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 and negativity. But also the idea of the shadow and the light as well, that um, her shadow falls as evidence of, of light. And therefore um, the darkness in, a, in an odd sort of way, the culture of the darkness, emphasises what is positive and what is, what is therefore light. Nice little contrast there. Two Christmas Carol uh, boxes. Why is Scrooge linked to Frog and Cold, do you think? Well, again, we talked about this a lot of times. Um, the Frog and the Cold link to the idea of um, him ignoring the outside world, rejecting the outside world. Um, and also the emotional coldness, how closed off he is, how insular, and, and all those sorts of things. A quotation one from Stave on them. I wear the something, I have something in life, I made it something by something. Of course, we're, we're with Marley in uh, Stave on. I wear the chain I forged in life, I made it link by link. And the vocabulary builder, what does the verb reminisce mean? Well, if you reminisce, you look back on memories, you think about the past, you engage with the past. And it does suggest a degree of positive experience about the memory as well. Um, you wouldn't necessarily reminisce about something negative uh, in the same way. Right, quick overview of today's session. So um, as with the previous lesson, we're looking at extracting information, evidence and ideas for the challenge. That's the basic thing that everybody will hopefully be doing today. Hopefully a lot of you also though will be pushing to that aspire. We're exploring how Dickens creates tone and atmosphere um, in this part of the text, and that is quite significant in the moment we're looking at in today's session. Now again, this should be a fairly familiar task. So on the left-hand side we have a quotation there, and if it's missing from it, there's a visual prompt as well. Now on the right-hand side there's these um, six prompts, the things you need to try to do with this quotation. Um, what's missing, as in missing words, who says it, who wrote it, where's it from, number three, and number four, what does it show, onto uh, picking out a feature, zooming in on something, and number six, connecting it, making a link to somewhere else. So the idea is you give yourself 30 seconds, you do as many of those things as you possibly can, and don't forget, if you can't think of missing words, you might still be able to remember who said it, for example, where it's from, so there's always stuff you could be doing with this. Give yourself 30 seconds, get down as much as you possibly can, end of that time, press play, and I'll run through some of the answers you may have come up with. Right, complete, what's missing? Uh, he was a type of his hand at the grindstone, Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, stripping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Who says it? Well, obviously it's from the narration, um, right at the start of stave one, by Dickens, um, as the narrator and Dickens as the author, which aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, number three, we've already answered, it's from the start of stave one. Number four, what does it show? Well, it shows Scrooge's um, self-centered negativity, the fact that he has negative impact on other people. 
and his obsession with the ownership of things, the control of things, the idea of money. Now, section, a future, or living on something. Um, we have the string of verbs, squeezing, wrenching, grasping, stripping, clutching, uh, which are quite neat. He's also making the idea of um, him being a covetous old sinner. And that's a fantastic field of religion there, and the idea that Scrooge's obsession with money is something which is um, uh, irreligious, uh, immoral. And a link somewhere else. We shift from this, this, the closed hand here, and the control and the, the ownership, to the generosity, I think, when we see him um, in stave five when he wakes up. And he's desperate to give out his money, and he's, and, you know, he's, he's the exact opposite of this. He's got a neat contrast there. Right, second quotation. Exactly the same task, um, the quotation here. Um, trying to through those purple watch prompts. 30 seconds, and that time for us to play, and um, I'll run through some answers. Right. So in terms of those three uh, missing words, we've got foggy yet and colder. It's piercing, searching, biting cold. That's the three missing words. Now, in terms of who says it, it's again from the narration in Save One from Dickens, which answers number three as well. Number four, uh, what does it show? Well, it does show the increased negativity, and that links to the idea of... Um, Scrooge's impact, his influence on society and the world. And also this idea of the, the decline into darkness and death of Scrooge as a character as well. That, you know, his end in, is, um, is impending, if you'll excuse the, the, the pun. A feature, to zoom in on something. Well, that triplet of verbs has got a neat one. Because they all suggest the idea of it being quite, quite negative, quite aggressive, um, quite well, self-consciously um, damaging to people. And I think to somewhere else. I quite like the link to Fred. If you look at Fred's character, Fred is someone who copes beautifully with the cold. He's seen as a positive force, um, in stage one in particular, when he comes into the into the into the um, the shop, and he's you know shiny and and and, and ruddy faced and glowing. Um, equally, in contrast could be uh, the link to fog and darkness, for example, um, when Scrooge wakes up at the start of stage two. Anything along those lines. Right, and the same task again. So, quotation on the left-hand side, prompt from the purple box, 30 seconds, go. Right, the answers are, um, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uh, it is, of course, Scrooge, in stave one, talking to Fred. What does it show? Well, it shows Scrooge's rejection, not just of Christmas, but of people who celebrate Christmas, um, the negativity he has and the quite aggressive negativity that he feels towards it. A feature, that's something to zoom in on. Well, the adaptation of these Christmas references, like uh, Pudding and the Stake of Holly, um, to become um, symbols of his rejection and his, his violent, aggressive rejection of Christmas, I think are quite neat. Uh, the plosives, boiled, um, pudding, buried, the bees and the peas, those aggressive sounds coming through as well. They would equally do. Uh, I think somewhere else, I mean, the fact that at the end of it, in stave five, um, he's someone who, like a child, celebrates Christmas and is joyful about Christmas, um, that would be quite a nice link at that point. Something along those lines. Right, and the same task again, and uh, a familiar quotation. This is one that you've probably picked up on by now, that I, I have a lot of time for. I tend to use a lot when um, I'm answering questions and that sort of thing. So, 30 seconds, purple box prompts, go. Okay, so the answers are, are there no prisons and the union workhouses? Now, obviously, it's Scrooge speaking in stave one, and he's speaking uh, to the portly gentleman here when they've asked for a donation. What does it show? Well, it shows a few things. It shows his rejection, of course, of Christmas and charitable giving, generosity, and so on. And, of course, um, the fact that he associates being poor with essentially being, being criminal. Bigger feature, zoom in. Uh, the trouble question, the fact that he sees this as almost like a, a logical process, an argument to be won. Um, this um, interrogative sort of structure, um, where it's not really dialogic, I think is important. Number six, make a link to somewhere else. Well, the classic link to this is, of course, always to stay three, and when Scrooge's words are repeated back to him by the ghost of Christmas present. Right, and the same task again, fifth quotation, uh, penultimate one for today. Puff box prompts, again, a classic quotation one, you know, you come for it numerous times. 30 seconds, go. Okay, so, 
What's missing? If they'd rather die, then we'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. It is, of course, Scrooge. Uh, he is, of course, talking to the portly gentleman again in stage one. Uh, what does it show? Well, it shows his callous disregard for um, the poor in society. The fact that he sees them all as, as a group rather than as individuals. And doesn't value life and death in the way that he maybe he maybe should um, socially. Uh, a feature something to zoom in on. I, again, the collective pronoun they, I always think, is a classic with this. Um, you know, he sees them as a group, they're defined by a group. And it's when he gets that revelation of these individuals, that's when he begins to change and to care. And therefore, I, mean, I think the best link, probably, is to when he sees um, Ignorance and Want and Tiny Tim in stage three, and it becomes suddenly a personal thing. He actually cares about them as individuals and asks the right questions. Right, and the last quotation for the moment. So again, 30 seconds, purple box prompts, go. Right, it was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. Um, who says it? Well, it's narration, obviously. It's describing Marley uh, near the end of stage one. What does it show? Well, it shows what the key aspects of his chain are. Um, it's been created out of his sinful acquisition of money, his lack of sympathy for other people, a sense of control, ownership, and so on. Take a feature and zoom in. Well, I said the symbolic aspect of the chain is the key one here, really, the idea of it representing um, his sinful misdeeds. And connection, make a link to somewhere else. I do think a good link for this one, the reference to Scrooge feeling as light as a feather in stage five, that he's got to the point where he's been relieved of the burden of his sins, and so on. That's quite a, quite a neat link to be making. And again, a slide that needs no introduction. So we have here the previous lesson's uh, summary in terms of the narrative that we worked through, and a setup for today's session as well. If it's useful, feel free. If not, feel free to just skip this and move on to the next part. Right, some extract annotation. Left-hand side, we have a, a section of the text. And on the right-hand side, we have three prompts here. Uh, one narrative, one character-driven, and one imagery-based. So read through the part of the text. Use the yellow box prompts to help you annotate the text. Uh, and again, as ever, you can do this on the script if you have the script in front of you. If not, you can do it, of course, on a printout of a lesson if you have that instead. If you don't have either of those, you can simply make notes either on uh, some paper, on a notepad, in your exercise book if you have that, wherever that works for you. If you've had a chance to work through those, you press play and on, uh, on the audio, and I'll work through some of the answers that you may have come up with. Okay, first one. After Marley, why is the first Brit Scrooge meets the ghost of Christmas past? Well, the assumption we make, really, is that in order for Scrooge to understand and to change, he's got to engage with all parts of the process. And some of that involves also engaging with um, the things that have caused him to be the way he is, and it's the movement from the past to the present and the future. In the past, some of Scrooge's choices, worst choices, there were things that he himself decided to do. He needs to recognise what choices he made and the, and the, the outcome of them. But also he has to understand the influences that have shaped him as a person, as a character, and acknowledge them. Second one then, character. How are the ghosts described here and how does Scrooge respond to it? Well, it's described as having a dwarfish stature and the voice is soft and gentle. Now Scrooge actually is quite assertive to it. Scrooge demanded, uh, it says, for example, um, he asked it some fairly personal questions, I mean, long past, for example, and so on. So his response is quite in interrogatory. He's someone who um, seems to want to, as with Marley, control, understand, dominate, dictate to, all those kinds of things. And that links us also to this third one, then, the imagery, the symbolic significance of the light, and how does it link Scrooge and his actions? Well, Scrooge, we've already seen, is linked to darkness, to cold, to fog, and all those negative influences. Whereas the light is something that is positive, bright, um, hope, and also about the clarity in terms of how we see the past. So Scrooge's interrogation of the ghost, I think, is important here. Um, but also his request to the ghost that it um, cover itself up with a cap and put out the light, if you'll excuse the Othello quote, uh, quotation, is also about his rejection of the clarity, his rejection of seeing the past um, symbolically, as well as just the literal um, pain he has and discomfort he has in terms of that light. 
Right, and a similar sort of task again. So on the right-hand side this time, we have this pile of text. On the left-hand side, this yellow box, again, we have these three prompts, character, language, and theme this time. So have a run-through, try and annotate as much as you can, make your own notes if, um, if that's how you're doing it. When you've had a chance to do that, press play again on this audio, and I'll run through some ideas. First one then, how does Scrooge behave towards the spirit? And how does this compare to how he behaves towards Marley? Has he changed at all at this point? Well, he's much more respectful, he's polite to this ghost in a way that he wasn't necessarily to Marley, at least to begin with. He reverently disclaims it, says, so he's being polite, but he does make bold to inquire. Now Dickens is being playful here in terms of this sort of humorous phrasing. So Scrooge expresses himself much obliged, so he does say thank you, but there's a sense of irony underpinning that, where Scrooge isn't entirely serious there. So has he changed at all at this point? A little bit. He's at least showing some respect. There's maybe an acknowledgement of the power of the spirit, and uh, a recognition of the higher power is, of course, an important stage in his, his redemption, his reclamation. Um, second one, then. To what extent is it interesting for the spirit to use the words welfare and reclamation? Well, welfare... Um, at the time and now, we do associate also with the idea of financial support to the needy. So we talk about the welfare budget, for example, it's a political term that is still used. So there is a resonance to it, which goes beyond the idea of simply Scrooge's well-being, how he is, to the idea of looking at well-being in a much, much broader societal and social sense. Reclamation also functions in a similar sort of way. Obviously, reclamation simply means to reclaim something. But reclamation has a financial link to it as well. Um, if you sell someone a product that they can't pay for, then what they, uh, there will be a reclamation, which is the taking back of something. So these things both have a relevance and a resonance in terms of the financial arrangements within society, and that Scrooge himself would have been part of. It's noticeable that Scrooge is really not taking it seriously. So when the ghost explains that it's there for his welfare, um, he says, for example, that uh, a night of unbroken rest, or sorry, thinks, so a night of unbroken rest would have been much more conducive to that end. Um, he'd rather have had more sleep. Um, at the very least, he doesn't say it, but the spirit seems to have heard his thoughts. He can't hide anything, it seems. Themes, then, the third prompt. Scrooge's worry about falling. How does this link to the spirit's religion to Christmas and to what Scrooge needs to do? Well, falling is a word that has connotations beyond simply the physical act of you know, dropping from a height. We talk about the idea of um, you know, the fall of man, for example. And there is a Victorian term for a, a fallen woman, which is a woman who's fallen on hard times and has turned to um, immoral means quite often to earn her living or her social status. To be a fallen woman, she's someone who's, who's been ruined socially. So when Scrooge is, when Scrooge is worried about falling, there is um, a resonance to that, which is, is religious. There's also the idea, though, of him being worried about falling. He doesn't trust anybody. He does, he's unwilling to rely on anybody else or let anyone in. To his um his sphere of influence, his sphere of experience, on a personal level. Now, Christmas is of course a time when um, Christians see it as a time where you know a child's been born who is destined to bring about their redemption, to offer them a chance at uh, being redeemed for their sins and so on. And it's therefore a time of celebration. So it's a time of faith, of religion, of the acceptance of higher powers, and the hope of redemption and reclamation. And it's all things that Scrooge himself has to accept. Um, and his concern about falling is a lack of faith, a lack of willingness to engage with those things. But the very fact that he does choose to do that, um, he has to accept those things beyond his control, and that that's fine, that's just part of how the world works and society works. And that he's a very, very small cog in a very, very large machine, and he can't see all the moving parts. And that's really that revelation at the end, is there, um, that the Spirit's forcing him to accept that there are others more powerful than he is. Right, and a similar task again. So extract on the left, four prompts on the right-hand side of that yellow box, setting character, language, and theme. Again, work through, annotate, make notes, however you're doing it, and then press play, and I'll run through some ideas. Right, let's start with the setting. Uh, the first location to which Scrooge is taken uh, is, of course, back to this, this, this country um, area, these country roads with fields and things. How's it contrast to the London he knows? Well, the London, as described in stage one, this place of, um, of dark, dingy streets and busy people and so on. And this seems to contrast almost directly with that. Um, in terms of the weather as well, in London it's cold, it's foggy, it's dark. Here it's light, it's bright, it's clear. What does it seem to represent? 
It seems to represent um, a contrasting past, a past which is cold but not negative, a um, place of, uh, of nature and openness. Um, and that does link, of course, to Scrooge as a child. Number two, then, character. How does the new setting impact on Scrooge? Well, good heaven is an interesting phrase for him to use. It is a very, very gentle, very, very mild expletive, this expression of surprise. But when he's clasping his hands together, you know, he's got his hands together, good heaven, there's a degree of religious reverence here, almost hinted at just below the surface there, which might be relevant. But also this, um, the estimation marks he uses, he seems excited, he seems pleased. Um, there's a degree of excitement there, which is, is, is unusual in, in contrast to Scrooge. He's surprised, um, and it seems like he's, it's a place he's forgotten. Third, the language. How does Dickens convey Scrooge's sense of excitement? Well, he uses the exclamation mark himself. And then we have this idea of um, conscious of a thousand odours floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts, and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. We have thoughts and hopes and joys and cares, this string of things that he's concerned about, the repetition of thousands as well. So we get this, this mild exaggeration, this string of emotional aspects which Scrooge seems to have lost contact with. And then this exclamation mark as well, um, I forgot the exclamation mark. And then the idea that Scrooge's um, lip is trembling, that he's upset, that he's emotional as a result, and that he's forgotten this, and the recollection of it is something that does, does emotionally impact on him. And number four then, theme. How does that link to the broader theme of memory in the text? Well, it's the idea that actually um, memory is something which is, uh, it causes who we are, but also our acceptance of it, our acknowledgement of it, our confrontation with it, our engagement with it, all these things help us to actually understand and contextualise who we are and how we think and our situations now. And if we lose touch with our past, then actually we don't understand who we are, and we're more inclined to behave in a way which is not appropriate, socially valuable, and so on. But our whole lives are connected in every direction, with other people now, um, other parts of society, with our future, with our past, and so on. And that all those points of connection, all that interconnectivity, is, is central to um, contextualising ourselves, understanding ourselves and our place within the world. Right, and another class that should look very familiar. So on the right-hand side we have some things you should be able to find evidence for in this part of the extract. On the left-hand side we have this part of the extract. So, you read it through, and then try and identify where in this text you can find evidence for uh, those things in the other boxes. Work it through, annotate, make notes as appropriate, and then press play, and I'll run through some ideas. Okay, first one. Scrooge seems transported to a past he had all but forgotten. Um, this reference to Scrooge recognising every gate, every post and tree, he has vivid memories of things now, and yet seems to have actually lost touch with it um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the present, in, in terms of the novel. But the detail he remembers about all these things, um, Scrooge knew and named them every one, he knows every single bit of it. And the second bit, Scrooge seems to enjoy recognising and experiencing the people he used to know. Um, the line, why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas? So, he's excited about this, he's joyful about this, and he can't seem to understand why. And that links to number three then, he feels confused about Christmas. So, this thing about um, Merry Christmas, as they parted at crossroads and byways of their several homes. Why was he filled with gladness about this? And then this line, what was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, what good had it ever done to him? The fact that he feels excited about this and um, you know, elated by this, and yet is still left with those questions he was asking in stage one about the relevance of it, the importance of it. Number four, um, there's a clear juxtaposition between the busy and sociable uh, on streets and the school. Well, when we get all these people calling out to each other and shouting to, shouting to each other, it's busy, it's sociable, um, it's exciting, it's, it's very Christmassy. And then there's a real mismatch between that, Scrooge's questions about the point of Christmas, and then the spirit's line, the school is not quite deserted, said the ghost, a solitary child neglected by his friends. So we go from rejoice, gladness, um, merry, and then we go to deserted, solitary, neglected, left there, really negative. Number five then, um, Scrooge has negative associations with his school life. Well, the very fact that he sobs when he hears about his school, I think, is a key, key aspect of that. It's a real negative um, association he clearly has. Another of these tasks, 
So on the left-hand side this time, we have five things that you should be able to find evidence for in this part of the text. So have a read through, annotate, make notes, whichever you're doing and wherever you're doing it, and then press play and I'll run through some points in terms of feedback. Right, the first one, the building in which the school was placed is run down and unwelcoming. Um, well, obviously we have the dull red brick and so on, but this line about, um, there's a large house but one of broken fortunes. Special offices were little used, walls were damp and mossy, windows broken against decayed. It's very much a negative rundown place, this is not a positive place. And it's reinforced by the idea of um, the dreary hall, poorly furnished, cold, vast, chilly, bareness. Very, very much negative in terms of that semantic field there. Many Scrooge's adult behaviour seem linked to his school experience as well. The school itself sounds very much like his home, um, as we heard about it in Stave One, cold, empty seeming, and so on. But also, when you look at Scrooge in that second paragraph here, um, we have this idea of a lonely boy reading near a feeble fire. So, the fact that he is sitting by a feeble fire, um, lonely and alone, that sounds very much like Scrooge in Stave One once again. Number three, Scrooge feels sad to see the child he once was. Well, when it says Scrooge sat down upon a form and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. There you go. Very, very easy to evidence that. Number four, Scrooge seems almost overwhelmed by the details and memories. Well, this reference to um, not a clicking in the fire, but fell upon his heart as Scrooge with a softening influence to give a freer passage to his tears. Every single aspect seems designed and just to, to prompt Scrooge to cry even more and more and more to see his younger self. And then this thing about the younger Scrooge seeming lost in his reading. Um, this is about him being uh, intent upon his reading. And then you know, the appearance of his character outside that the child doesn't look at because they're too immersed in the book. Um, and that's important as well for number five there. Right, and another extract annotation task. Left hand side, extract, right hand side, three things to try and find evidence for in this piece of the text. Again, press play when you're ready, and I'll run through some ideas. Right, the first one. The young Scrooge escaped his loneliness through stories and imaginary characters which seem real to him. Well, the very fact that he, he, he sees these characters in the text, Alibaba, for example, um, you know, we have Valentine, Orson, uh, Salt Groom, etc. These are all fictional characters which Scrooge is seeing as if they're real. Um, and it's that reliving of his childhood imagination and his desire to engage with this imaginative world out there, um, the world beyond the real and the physical and scientific. Second one, the adult Scrooge still seems to be able to lose himself in the past imaginings. Well, that second paragraph there, um, to hear Scrooge expending all the earnest of his nature on such a subject, in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, um, and that links to the third one as well. That's dramatically different from him at the start. He was, you know, um, misanthropic, aggressive almost, certainly very negative seeming um, in stave one when we saw him. And yet here, he, he's excitable, excited, um, you know, um, laughing and crying. Now the references here, um, if you don't know them, Ali Baba is a character from um, the Arabian Nights, which is um, Detective Dickens was a huge fan of. I've got the reference to Robinson Crusoe as well, um, which is Robinson Crusoe and the parrot and so on. Um, Valentine and Orson um, is um, a, a myth, really, about um, you know knights and wild men living in the woods and things. Again, which was, which was sort of current. Now Dickens is telling us about kind of key stories that he as a child very much enjoyed. So there is also an interesting aspect to pick up on this, which is about Dickens giving us this semi-autobiographical um, insight into his childhood through this. But more of that later. Right, and the last uh, bit of the extract for today. Again, left-hand side extract, right-hand side, two bigger pro uh, questions, rather. In the yellow box, we have the bigger question about uh, why Scrooge feels sad for his former self and also feels guilty about the carol singer. And then in the green box, an extension question as well, to push it a little bit further about why this is an important step in the process of Scrooge's uh, redemption. Have a think, annotate, make a few notes, and when you've had a chance to do that, you can press play again, and I'll run through a few ideas that you may have, uh, you may have considered. Okay, first one then. Why is this sad that Scrooge, sorry, why is it that Scrooge feels sad for his former self and also guilty about the carol singer? 
Well, the sadness seems to be, um, in pity for his former self, poor boy, I wish it's too late. Um, two things going on here. One is that he seems to feel sad at the loss of the innocence of his childhood, and also feel sympathetic towards the child he was, um, in terms of how mistreated, how abandoned, and how lonely he was. Now, we see here Scrooge engaging with, uh, with, with, with a child. I mean, yes, it's himself, but it's, it's a sad child, and sympathising and engaging with somebody else on a sympathetic level. And that is a key, a key shift for him. It's also um, linking to this under the, the, the carol singer, because this is a child who was being um, innocent, expressing themselves, looking for joy and pleasure and sharing joy and pleasure, looking to connect with someone. And of course, Scrooge rejected them outright, um, very assertively. And that links to the extension question then. Why is it an important first step in the process of Scrooge's redemption? Well, Scrooge's redemption, it does require him to engage with his past and recognise the fact that, yes, some of it was under his control, but also some parts weren't. He was not always thus. Here we see him as someone who, with an imagination, someone who is open to the world and excited by experience and you know, fiction and those, those other levels um, on which people function beyond simply the rational and scientific. And it's important that Scrooge acknowledges those and feels sorry for somebody before he can actually move on. He's got to engage emotionally and recognise that causal process which has led him to uh, his present state. But also to recognise that there are current parallels with his own childhood and that he himself is a negative influence and has a capacity to be a positive influence. That's the first hint of it, I think, coming through here. Right, another task that should look familiar. So we have here four provocations, four statements which are open to debate and open to interpretation. All right. So the idea is you look at each one and you decide the extent to which you agree with this in terms of how much you've read of the text so far and your knowledge of the story. For each one, make a few notes, have a, have a think about it, and if you can, be quite specific with that. It links to quotations, key moments in the text, uh, anything along those lines would be really, really useful. We've had a chance to, uh, to do that. Press play again, and I'll run through a few kind of responses that you may have come across with these, or a few ideas you may have bounced around yourselves. First one then, Scrooge represents the problems with the views the rich have of the poor in Victorian society. Well, I think Dickens is very clearly giving us that as a steerage point in the text. Um, Scrooge links to the poor, of course, um, in terms of prisons, workhouses, and so on. That's how he sees them. But also, um, he engages, engages with the, the quite patronising view of the poor as well, that the poor are helpless and needy, and there is no joy or life in them, that they are simply poor and destitute and miserable and sad and criminal. And actually, there is a far richer level of experience in the life of the poor that we see in stage one and stage two. Um, yeah, I think Dickens wants us to, to engage with that. Bottomless, then, Dickens sees Christmas as a time for family, friendship and a sympathy for those less well-off. I think that's kind of unarguable, really. Um, although Scrooge rejects all those things, we are very, very clearly not intended to engage with Scrooge and agree with Scrooge. Dickens wants us to interrogate Scrooge and question those things. Um, when we see, we see Fred, for example, and Bob Cratchit, you know, these are times of joy and love and so on. Um, and even the negative example of Scrooge's childhood is one that's offered almost as a, a counter-example. This is not something we're supposed to agree with um, or feel pleased about. It's meant to be like a negative example that shows us what things are supposed to be like. They're not supposed to be about you know, abandoning a small child by themselves at school at this time of year. Top right, Scrooge is individually and symbolically responsible for the problems in both his own life and in society as a whole. Well, this is one of those debatable ones. Yes, to an extent. Uh, Scrooge is someone who individually makes choices in his past that lead to his current circumstance and that lead to his, um, his unhappiness and the unhappiness of those around him. However, it is not as simple as that. His childhood, for example, when we see him at school, it was not a choice that he made. He was abandoned at school. Uh, we do find that quite consistently throughout stage two. And therefore, he's only partially responsible for his own actions. And that acceptance of the things he cannot change and also his recognition of the things he can change is an important little watershed, this sort of Rubicon he has to cross um, in terms of those kind of key ideas. So yes, on an individual level, that's absolutely correct um, to an extent, but there is a, another level to it in terms of um, his lack of control when he's younger. And in a broader symbolic sense as well, yes, in terms of society as well. Um, society's mistreatment of the, of the poor and needy, the young, also leads to further problems later on. 
Right, through his childhood seems to have turned him into the antisocial individual he is now. He's shaped by his past. Yes, yes, to an extent. Um, that is correct. We do see him in Stave On, obviously by the fire, by himself, lonely, isolated, um, and so on. However, there are signs of hope still for Scrooge um, in Stave 2. In later encounters we have with him, when we see him with Belle, for example, when we see him um, at Frederick's party, um, he's not entirely beyond redemption, but also there are choices he makes later which also cause him to be the way he is. So it isn't as simple as that, really, um, although that is partially correct, as with you know almost all of these statements. Right, and a plenary task that uh, basically focuses on you to try and draw together some of the learning from today and to try and situate that within our wider understanding of the text. So the idea is we have down here these seven different moments from the text so far. Steps. First one is to try and place them in the correct chronological order, the order in which they occur in the text. Secondly, decide why they're important and add the stave number, number three, if you can. There is an extension version of this, which is to try and add a quotation that links to the key moment as well. Um, and hopefully lots of you would feel you're able to do that. So, for example, the first one you would go for is, of course, Marley is dead and Scrooge carries on as before. Why is it important? Well, we start with death and it kind of prefigures, it foreshadows Scrooge's own later demise, but also it shows Scrooge's lack of engagement or sympathy, um, or grief at the loss of his sole friend, his sole living partner, and so on. And of course, that's right at the start of stave one, and a quotation to add as well. Right? So run through those seven, try and put them in the right order, why are they important, stave number, and a quotation. Now, this should be one that you can do yourselves, so I'm not going to give any notes on this afterwards or any feedback, um, but do try and run through these. I would also point out that these are seven quite important moments in the novel so far. So quite a good way of actually setting up some, uh, some useful revision notes for later on when you return to this text. Right, and that brings us full circle back to the overview of the session. Obviously a lot of annotation in today's, uh, today's activities, so hopefully all of you feel you've had a chance to look at extracting information, evidence and ideas from, from this part of stave two. But I also would hope a lot of you will, um, you know, through those those bigger questions and the, the plenary and the provocations as well, um, have engaged with kind of exploring how Dickens does those things and the impact that um, those aspects have in stave two. Thank you very much for your time, and I will see you in our next session together.